I see a four string bass, I see six string, I see a lot of strings, but the diddly bow is one string. Those of you who don't know the instrument or know me playing this, this is um, this is um, very special. In fact, uh, Sprocket supplied me with this string. I came, this is where I buy my diddly bow strings, it's David Gage's. So this is the one string, it's a D string, an upright bass string tuned to C. I'm going to play it for you a number of different ways. I'm going to play it for, with, for you just with sticks, and then I'm going to play some funk with stick and, fin and uh, fingering with my thumb and hand. Okay? I'm sorry those who aren't up front who can't see what I'm doing. <laughs>
told you you couldn't see back there, you know, so. And then the, uh, the tremolos. Play, you know. I just take it up a notch. You know, just take it to a different place. You know. And um, it's it's actually a zither since we're in a that kind of a place because it's one string, a monochord with a bridge and a bridge. It's a zither. It's 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 like and I'm playing it tangents, touching. So it's like the beginning of the piano. It's the first piano. That's how I think of it. It's the before there were pianos, there was, before there were the many, there was the one. In the beginning, there was the one, right? From all the one comes all of music. That's how I think. When I play, I think of this thing. This is, this is the thing that, that, that in the physical, that demonstrates to me that, that all of music is in the one string. You know? Yes? What? Hello, Jan. Hi, what got you attracted to that? I didn't hear you. What got you attracted? When did you start doing service? Uh, come here, come here. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, my dear friend Mark Edwards, along with David S. Ware and some other people, came to New York City back in 1973. The band called Apogee. And we came to, to tear up the place, right? Right. And that's, that's, what, that's what we were doing. We were, the, we were the real new cats on the block. You know, we were the, 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 the young lords, and we, and we were going to give them all hell. Okay, and uh, what happened was that, you know, I'm a piano player, and David S. is a tenor player, so he went with, he went with Cecil Taylor, and, and David went with Cecil Taylor, so I didn't have a band anymore. <laughs> and this is all published. I didn't have a band anymore. So, so, uh, Jimmy Hopps, drummer, right. Jimmy Hopps, great drummer, was living with us right, right up the street on Canal Street, Canal Street down by uh, uh, Hudson Street. And, uh, and he said, this is an opportunity for you. I was very depressed. <laughs> no, I was depressed. I didn't have a band. We came to New York. I didn't have a band. And they're with the master. He, they're with the master. And I'm, uh, I'm just with me. And Jimmy Hopps came. He sat with me down on Canal Street, 501, right down the street. Every day he sat with me. And he, we would draw pictures and paint with with watercolors and magic markers, and I didn't know that he was giving me therapy. I didn't know that. I was impressed. No, that's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Okay? He was a man. He was a, he was a, a shaman. I mean, he's still alive. He's living out in Colorado. He's a brilliant man, brilliant drummer, a shaman. And he was fixing me. Okay? So then one day I was walking down Canal Street, and I got to Canal and Green, and there was a bundle of wood there, and I picked up that bundle of wood. And I took it back to my fifth floor studio, and I was kneeling down at that bundle of wood. And Jimmy Hopps, who lived in a little closet on the fifth floor, was walking by me with that kneeling by the bundle of wood. And he said, "That's your future." And he went on in his room. <laughs> you, you asked me, "This is how this stuff works. This is how it works." He said, "That's your future." And that day, I built my first instrument. Okay. That was May 1974. Between May and August, I built maybe 20 different kinds of instruments. And then in the end of August, he came to me. He says, gather all your instruments. You and Alan brought them. Gather all the instruments and come over to this uh, uh, recording studio over on Green Street. So I did that, took all, got a cab, took them all over. And 
And when I walked in, it was uh, Howard Johnson's tuba band was recording. Oh. <laughs> okay? And he had Joe Bonner playing piano, uh, no, uh, the piano player was playing tuba. And, and after that session, we took all the instruments in, and then Joe Bond, who had been playing tuba, ended up grabbing my heart. I had a lot of instruments. And then Cecil McBee was there, and he played my twanger, a different instrument. Then Cecil McBee's son was playing, and William, uh, um, Alan Brothman, Jimmy Hobbs, David S. Ware, uh, cellist Ronald Lipscomb, they all took these instruments and they recorded. We recorded for three hours. Took all the instruments back to the crib, down the street, and I said, what was that, Jimmy? He said, that was your session. <laughs> and I said, well, who's going to pay for it? He said, I'm calling Roberta Flack right now, and Roberta paid for it. No. <laughs> this, this is the truth. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth. How stuff works. You ask me how. So, but I didn't build this instrument until, you know, I was very depressed. I left New York, went back to Virginia. The first week there, my Volkswagen bus, which I had driven all around the country, <laughs> broke down in front of my house. Okay? It didn't work anymore. The, the, so I, I took the um, the emergency brake cable, which went from the front to the back of the bus, I took it out and I put it on a, a seven-foot two-by-four. <laughs> like this, seven foot, okay? And I hit it and I said, what is this thing? What am, I don't know what's going on. I'm telling this truth. I don't know what's going on, but something is moving me to do stuff. And I'm hitting, I'm hitting, and then I put a pickup on it and I beat it. It didn't work, it didn't work. And I, and I, and then I got a job at uh, uh, American University playing dance classes. And while I was there, a man came to me and said, I'm looking for an instrument, a bass instrument. And I said, I think I've got an idea. So I had an electric bass string, and I made one for him. And he started to play it. And I said, oh, I, I, can, I can do it better. You know? <laughs> and I went home and made me one. But it wasn't until 10 years later I was playing on the street down Broadway, okay, near near City Hall, in front of the federal the federal building. Mm -hmm. I was playing out front, making a hustle, and this this woman comes. She says, "Stay right there, stay right there. I'll be right back." And she brings her husband back. Her husband was a sergeant on the police force, and he took his wife every Wednesday when he was off duty on Wednesdays. He was, he was into street musicians and, and, and guys, people who played in the subway. And she said, he, he just carries me around. Everyone's <laughs> holding me around all over the city listening to street musicians. And he said to me, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, that's really, that's really interesting. But you know, you can make a lot more money if you make it look better because it was just a bore. Because <laughs> people will pay you more money if it looks good. <laughs> I was, I was making about $30 a day. The next day, I made $75. Okay? And because of that, I started working the instrument. I started working. I said, I can make money playing like this. And I worked it, and I worked it, and I worked it. And I realized nobody else was doing it, so I had a niche. You know, I had a niche in this, on the New York. Now, now William. I'm, I'm, I'm really, you can sit down, though. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm playing. No, I'm telling you, you ask me this stuff because, you know, we, we don't often have an opportunity to explain how this stuff works. We right. think it's just, you know, you just, no, you know. So, so I'm walking down the street because I've been working this thing, okay? And, and, and Charles Gale comes up to me. He's, you know Charles Gale? Yes. Yes. Okay. Charles Gale, he says, hey, Cooper, I'm looking for a bass player. I'm playing at the Knitting Factory tonight. I said, man, Charles, I, I play. He said, what do you mean? You piano. You. I said, no, I have a, a bass. I play bass. He said, what kind of bass? So I said, I play diddly bow. He said, well, what's a what, what's diddly bow? I said, no, man, it's got to look like a bass. So he needed that shape. So what, what that said to me, even the hippest cats, even the hippest cats aren't always so hip. You know? And then I thought, wow, this is a good thing. This, I have something to prove. You understand? I have something to prove. So that's when I really started playing this. And then the, my, I only brought this instrument tonight because I'm going to play a little piano. Uh, I only brought this. I had 
lots of different instruments. Doreen and Ashton know I've got, you know, they're all over the place. You know. Some of them I just hide up in the sheet. You know. they're, they're, they're like children, you know, you have to give them all attention. So, so Ayana, thank you for, for the question. That was a great question. Uh, young, you still teaching science at Hunter? Yeah. Huh? Still teaching science? Yeah, no, no, it's music. But it, uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, Ayana was my son's science teacher in elementary school. Uh, 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 <laughs> now, I, I'm going to play piano now. Now, don't get disturbed by all of this because sometimes I play piano for people. Just play for y'all because my, my, my life has been, you know, you're supposed to play for the audience, you know. But I'm going to show you what I do now when I play piano. What, and it started, William, back in 1970, okay? When I was trying to find, because when you go to hear me play piano or with William or with anybody else, you listen for these things that I'm going to show you tonight. You know, this is maybe more of a workshop than a performance. What, what I realized that was that uh, when I was growing up, you know, you know, you, you, you learn changes and harmonies. You know, you learn the, the triadic harmonies, and then I heard um, McCoy Tyler with Train. Back in what? Back way back, you know. And I said, "Wow, can I ever play that?" And when I understood what he was playing, which was like quarters and fifths, you know. So I said, well, I can't do that. He's doing that. And then, I, and back in 1969, really, uh, I got a, a, a commission to do a, a, a choral piece with it, you know, musicians at Boston University. So I said, I got to come up with something different. So I said, what about seconds? You know? <laughs> you know so, so I said, well, here's seconds here. You know, you make a second into a, a, a ninth, or you make it into a seventh, you know. That was a major second. Then you have minor seconds, which can turn into major sevens or. So that's what I've been working the past 30 some years. I've been working seconds. So when, when you hear me play, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you hear all those kind of elements, I'm gonna play for you now. You hear this? You hear this? So I'm gonna play. of 2012, I've been out on the road with Mark Rebo. And, you know, Mark Rebo pays a lot of money, you know. So I made a lot of money when I went out with you. ever been out with Mark? <laughs> and Mark paid a lot of money, and I came back, I bought me a nice expensive keyboard, and then after I worked and worked, and then I went in the studio because I had money from Mark. Oh, I'm Mark uh, <laughs> so I went in the studio and, and I recorded and using the seconds, okay, and, and, and my dear friend uh, Adam Lord was there recording me and we have it all documented. Then I realized that I'd heard these sounds before when I was a little boy. 
And there, there was a man named, what was his name? Oh, God. Gene who? Quickly. Gene Quickly. Gene Quickly grew up with my parents in Virginia. And he played piano. And one day, but when he was in the eighth, uh, I guess he was like 13 years old, he had to leave town because there was no high school for black people then. So he had to go to the city and go, and go to high school. And he, but when he became an adult, he came back. And my parents, when he walked through the door, they were just smiling and happy. And my father said, come play, come play for my son. And this man walked into uh, you know, my the room where I had piano, and he played. And this is how he played. years. I've heard it. This man who could, who could. Now people said, why? So I told my father when the man, I said, he's playing all wrong, daddy. <laughs> and, and, and he said, no, because, because, you know, these are, this is a time when there was no PAs. And they were playing like barns and joints. And if he didn't play like that, he, no one would ever. If he played like this, there's no one would hear him. And people wouldn't want to hear it. They had to hear some stuff, you know. That's what, so you're going to hear all that stuff now.
That's grump hole. So I'm going to do grump and grump hole. Beautiful. Then maybe I'll play uh, the tune I wrote for David S. Ware. Mm -hmm. Begin one. We'll see. Uh, this piece, um, the beautiful, was uh, dedicated to um, who's the Mexican woman, the uh, painter. Frida. Frida. What's her name? Frida Kahlo. <laughs> that Frida. <yeah. laughs>
gonna tell a little story about Rem Parker. We, we, Rem Parker, he, cause he know he, he has a better memory. Okay. I first met Wim in, in, in the summer of 1973 at a rehearsal over in the firehouse on East 10th Street. Tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've been playing with a saxophone player named Mudan Slaughter. He owed me money from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mudan had this, uh, he would play the saxophone, but he had this backward bend. And so he would bend way back, almost to like he was like a reverse junkie kind of thing. <laughs> and then he'd, then he'd go back forward, but he'd do this rocking thing. Uh -huh. And he had all these, he had this music, and he was so, he, so, he was so happy, he said, well, at that time, he said, you know, uh, Gene Ashton's coming from, he's going to rehearse with us, he's going to rehearse with us. I used to be known as someone else. Right. <laughs> but in any case, so, it helps, you know, when you owe IRS and all those people you know, <laughs> change your name, you know? Now, I don't remember who, who was the drummer. Now, who was that drummer? I don't know. It could have been Phil King. Uh, Phil King was a, a, one, one of the a Mystery Zone drummers from the Lower East Side. What's the Mystery Zone? <laughs> well, well, definition. A definition of a, a Mystery Zone is a guy who you, who doesn't you don't really know how he learned what he learned. It's like, a, it's like in the, in the uh, shamanistic world, they call it a Nelly. Huh? A Nelly is somebody who's just born, and then they can play and do what they do. Uh -huh. uh, Sun Ra was a Nelly. Yeah. And um, also, uh, Henry Grimes is a Nelly. Whoa. Uh, but anyway, Phil King was a Nelly. Okay. So. Uh, so we're at a guy's house. He lived in a firehouse. His name was Juice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Alan Glover. He might have heard play on resurface. And we play there. I'm just giving him a little background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was on 11th Street between B and C. And um, I would was that was the time I was walking from the. It's not about me, but I just give you this as a background. I was walking <laughs> from the Bronx down to Manhattan. And my first stop when I got down to Manhattan was the firehouse with Juice. So it was around like one or one o'clock. We'd already done something. So he said, "Oh, Gene Ashton's coming. Gene Ashton's coming." It was in the day, right? It was in the daytime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you want me to tell him note for note what it is? Because <laughs> it, it, it was a little like so. So so he yeah, then, more gets there. We we play. We we he start, We start playing his music. And then he stops me. He says, I want you to do this. Play, I want you to play like so and so. And I said, because this is, I was very arrogant back then, you know. He said, I said to him, he said, I want you to play like this and so and so. I said, don't tell me how to play. <laughs> and I got angry. Did I break anything? I don't know. No, but you told him his music was notated wrong. Oh. <laughs> And we were playing his music and his father's music. He said, this music is notated wrong. And, and, and um, Mouton was like, he was shocked. He, that had never happened to him before. But, the, but I loved it. <laughs> because the guys from 501 Canal Street. That's down the street where we live. Down the street where we live. They were like the heavy duty guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they were David S. Ware. You know, David oh. S. Ware, <coughs> Cooper Moore, Mark Edwards, David Sapper, um, yeah. Alan Brockman. Yeah. Uh, Chris who? Chris Amber. Chris Amber. I don't know if he was heavy duty. Who? Who? Chris? Chris? Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I never ran. I didn't ba the bass player. Not the bass player. I didn't run into anything <laughs> heavy duty with Chris personally. Not, not that he wasn't heavy duty, but I'm just saying. <laughs> You know, no, he, he was. He was. He, he was heavy duty. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Was he playing with y'all? Yeah. Man. Okay. All right. Uh, so come from right. California. Came from California. Yeah. All right. All right. Anyway, <laughs> it was him. then the other segment was William Hooker, who was walking around with a big afro and a long beard and he, in an overcoat in the summertime, and he was walking around. He didn't live with us. No, he didn't live with you. No, we wouldn't let him in. But he, <laughs> But he was one sanction, and then the other one was the guy was Ensemble Muntu with Jameel Moondock and Arthur Williams and Rashid Sanam. Oh, yeah. And so you had these three satellites 
But they were the, they were the heavy duty guys. Heavy duty. Heavy duty because they went right <clears throat> to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, they didn't feel like, you know, like, with the mirror who was still writing, they were still writing tunes. <laughs> but David and Mark and Coopermore, and when they had Dave Sapper, they went right to the Holy Ghost. Oh. Well, you, you, you understand that, that come, come here, because you got to be in the light, too. Mark Edwards was the, was the motor. Wow. See, every, everybody understood their role in the band, and and there was no giving up. Wow! Understand? Was no, there was no giving up. I, here's a story. In Boston, we're playing at the Black Avant Garde, which was like a, a coffee house under a church. Don't tell that. No, I'm gonna tell. This a beautiful story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful because it, it goes to the point. We're playing, the three of us, we're playing, we're playing, we're pushing and pushing and pushing. David, we're not, all of a sudden it's just David and me, just David and me. And then we finish and we look around and he's unconscious. <laughs> he's on the floor. That's how hard he played. Wow. That's, a, that's how hard he played. And we had a, a rehearsal space and we would rehearse three or four hours in the morning and then he and David would go to work. And then we come back in the evening and we play and play and play till after midnight. We did this every day. Every every day we did that, you know. And and be, and then when we came to New York, we we thought everybody was doing that. That's the truth. We thought everybody was doing that, but everybody wasn't doing that. And we found out that there were a lot of half stepping. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. It was a transitional period from the 70, 1972, go moving to the 1980s, and, and, and what happened was the, well, Chicago, Los Angeles, and St. Louis musicians came in, and they, and they were not, they were playing some other kind of music. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They were playing, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you, all right, you tell me the truth here today. Tell me the truth. <laughs> okay. Why'd they get written by? Drugs. Well, yes. there was that, but there was also, you know, they were a little bit, they were intellectual. Oh. See, when we came around, Lester Bowie would say, here comes a wild bunch. Wow. They don't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> they play for three hours without stopping. You, can, you, can, you guys can't make any money playing three hours without stopping. <coughs> and then they told some other saxophone players that they need to play some standard tunes. But they didn't mess with Frank Wright. But they messed with the other Frank. You know, and they told him, and said, you got to play some standard tunes. And then his thing, his, he, he, because his, 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 he had, his mind was a little, he had a weaker mind. Right. You know, but Frank Wright said, don't, you know, Frank Wright would go off on somebody, and he continued to be the rev. But other people brought their sounds in, and they brought their thing, and they tried to be European. You know, it's, it's, so these guys come in with this European stuff, and composition, and, you know, all this stuff. But you, you, you compose. I compose. Yeah, everybody can compose. Cecil composed, Sun Ra composed. They're not the only composers in the world. Anybody can compose some music. No. You know, we all compose music, but I'm saying, but you compose music, but you also know about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Meaning that you compose the music, but you don't reject the Holy Ghost. That's right. <laughs> That's all. But anyway, these guys were heavy duty, and they, we highly respected y'all. We highly respect. We were up at WKCR once. Huh? We were up at WKCR. Y'all did a session and we did a session. So y'all were, and you know, I mean, I've seen certain musicians come to 501 Canal Street and leave when David started playing. Mm -hmm. They left. Mm -hmm. Why would they leave? Because they couldn't deal with it. They couldn't hack it. They couldn't hack it. And I'm not naming any names. If you want to know that? Jazz yeah, Babylon later. But, <laughs> but it was heavy right. duty because it was really connected to the spirit and those of us that heard it loved it. Yes. And it was very inspirational. Uh, and then you learn more and more and more about the people. You learn about uh, 
Well, I learned, you know, I played with David, you know, after that period, and just learned more and more and more about him. But I also learned more and more about Coopermore when I found out about the Ashimba. The Ashimba. Ashimba, Ashimba, which was that bundle of wood yes. that he found and put it together and made it into a marimba, but we called it Ashimba. The Ashimba had 11, has 11 bars. And, 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 and I say to people now, when I started building the instruments, they started informing the piano because they were simple. They were, they were limited, one string, okay? It really grew my imagination, the 11 bars, or the, the mouth bow, the one string. It, it, it made me think of the piano differently. So now when you hear me playing the palms, and because I'm thinking of it as one, as one string now, okay? That talks, like the, the diddly bow talks, or the mouth bow talks. So when you hear me play, that's, that's what, what I want you to understand, that this is, the piano is being informed by the instruments. And when you hear me play the diddly bow, it's been informed by the technique that I learned as a piano player. Left hand, right hand, bass lines, melodies, you know, harmonies, tremolos, etc. You know. But but that book that I gave to uh, William earlier, it, it's true that you know William writes books, you know, not just word books, but music books. And and I guess I had known one I knew people who wrote tunes and they kept them at home, but he publishes them. And he does interviews and he publishes them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's the musician who's leaving the, the, the legacy, you know. We, can, we have writers here, you know, and you, leave, leave a, you will leave a legacy. But for William to be inside of the music and for him to come into our house as in another musician who we really respect, he gets to us, you know. He gets to us and we tell him stuff. I mean, that's stuff, I want to read the stuff that's not in the books that you won't put in the books until, until all the people are dead, right? <laughs> I, unless I change names. <laughs>